Welcome everybody to the ninth lecture in our course on microcontrollers, uh, specially recorded for my bright spots. Now uh, today we're going to look at clocks. Now if we mention the word clock, I'm sure that uh, most of you uh, have that in mind. But when we talk about computer clocks, we definitely aren't talking about this. Uh, that is not a clock in computer language. A clock in computer language is more like a metronome. Uh, when you're playing a piece of music and you want to keep the rhythm perfect, then you set your metronome up and it goes tick-tock, tick-tock while you play. And that helps you to play at exactly the right tempo. Uh, while you're learning, of course, or in the concert you don't switch on the metronome. But uh, it gives you a feeling of how fast the music should be. It sets the beat. And uh, similarly, a clock is like a drummer in, uh, in, in an army, uh, of course the olden days armies, um, who would set the pace for the guys who were marching. If the drummer wasn't there, then the pace wasn't as correct and... Uh, the guys who were marching would have to vocalize and say, hup, ha, hup, ha, etc. But um, if the drummer's there, then everybody knows what uh, pace they should march at and uh, everybody marches together. That is what a computer clock is all about. And uh, we've seen this in lots of places. This is just one example. Uh, here we have our Intel Core i9 uh, computer chip and uh, they advertise that it works at 3 gigahertz under normal conditions and if you really boost it up, turbo boost it, it will go up to 5.8 gigahertz. That means that inside this uh, computer chip there is a clock which is ticking away 3 billion times a second where I refer to the the billion as the Americans say billion in Afrikaans we refer to it as milliard which is the more correct term and uh, so so this clock is ticking and talking 3 billion times a second. But that's a computer clock. Uh, it's got nothing to do with finding out whether you're late for supper or not. Um, when we want to refer to a computer uh, with a clock that tells us the time and sometimes even the date, or very often the date, then in computer language we refer to this as a real-time clock. So a clock is something that sets the beat of the electronic component and a real-time clock will tell us both time and in almost every situation also the date and uh, sometimes also the day of the week or the week in the in the, the year which uh, number week is this in this year uh, so this is what a computer real-time clock is about that's telling time and so if we look in the uh, literature we can actually google and find out what can we use 
for, as a real time clock. And uh, we'll find, among others, uh, this component advertised. Well, this is its data sheet. And uh, this is a DS1307. And uh, as the description says it's a serial real-time clock. Uh, is a low power, full binary code, decimal, etc., etc. Whole description and all of its benefits and features. So, if we want to connect a real-time clock to our Arduino, then uh, this is the one that we're going to connect today. Um, what does it look like? Well, this is a USB stick just to give us a, a feeling of size. And uh, here are two of those chips, the DS1307 chips. Eight legs that uh, can tell us that we can connect to, which will tell us the time. And then over here is something that's interesting. This is the timekeeper of a computer clock, in most cases, of a real-time clock, and even, nowadays, of a wristwatch clock. Um, we've all seen the uh, uh, referring to people referring to uh, clocks as being a quartz clock and this is the quartz that actually the quartz crystal that actually sets up the time so what is a quartz crystal All right so this is a quartz crystal and uh, you can see it has a whole lot of facets, surfaces, a little bit. Uh, it's got a couple of inclusions in it. In other words, it's not quite, quite perfect. But uh, what do you expect with a crystal of this size? And of course, they very seldom come at a size like that, they usually come with sizes like this or, of course, a lot smaller. So this is a quartz crystal, a perfect crystal consisting of silicon and oxygen, silicon dioxide. Just like water is H2O, uh, this is SiO2, silicon dioxide quartz. Right, here I have an oscilloscope. Now that's a very long word, but uh, all it is is that trace that's going along from left to right, that measuring the voltage that this uh, oscill oscilloscope is connected to. And uh, here we have the, the voltage per division. So in other words, every one of these blocks are 5 volts high and, uh, and a whole lot of other information. But the important thing is that that is 5 volts per each division. And what I have here is just a thin piece of brass and stuck on top of that brass is a quartz crystal or a slab, a wafer of a quartz crystal. And they've put a little bit of, of contact uh, on it some aluminium or tin or something to make uh, good contact with the uh, the quartz crystal and I have two contacts 
soldered to it. And uh, over here is my, I've connected that to the probe of the oscilloscope. Now, the interesting part comes when I push on the quartz crystal with my pencil. Right? So just, just by pushing lightly on this, relatively lightly on this with my, with my pencil, I actually generate a voltage. Quite amazing. So much, and it's so sensitive, that I actually can, it can react to my voice. Hello. Now that's a little bit lower voltage, so I'm going to take that down. Okay, so it's now a, a fifth of a volt per division. And uh, if I now say, hello. Hello. Hey. 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 <laughs> Etc. <cetera. laughs> so, so this can actually react to my voice, and uh, you can actually see the waves uh, going by as I'm talking. So that is the very unique or interesting property of quartz. You see now, of course, just the lightest tap gives us a massive signal on the oscilloscope. I'm going to turn that sensitivity down again to 5 volts each division and just show, show, show you again. how the quartz, by pressing on it, gives us a voltage. And this is called the piezoelectric effect. Fine, so now that we know what a quartz crystal does, we can open up that little, little teeny weeny tin, very small <laughs> tin, um, and look inside, and lo and behold, inside is this quartz crystal. Now, just to give you an idea as to how small th this is, this is one of my eyebrow hairs. So that shows you the size of, of this crystal. And uh, you can see there it's transparent, like quartz is. And here is a gray uh, rectangle. And that is actually a contact that has once more been evaporated onto the surface of this, this crystal. In other words, we... We heat up a metal extremely hot inside a vacuum and then it boils and then the metal, shall I call it steam, the metal vapor uh, lands on anything that's cold and uh, uh, solidifies and forms, forms a little thin uh, layer of metal on the quartz crystal. So... Here we have this contact, and then you can see down here at the bottom, the contact becomes thinner. That's where it's connected to the one wire. And down there, you can actually see the contact, which is on the other side of this crystal. And it comes out and is connected to the other wire. And so when we, uh, if we were, 
to connect this crystal uh, to a voltmeter like we did, an oscilloscope, and we were to push on this, then we would get a voltage due to this quartz crystal in between those two contacts. But this quartz crystal is wonderful in that it works backwards as well. In other words, instead of pushing on it and or deforming it to get a voltage out, you can, you can uh, put a voltage on it which will cause it to deform. And of course, the minute you let that voltage off again, it undeforms and gives you the voltage in the opposite direction, just like we saw on, that, on the oscilloscope. So this crystal then is able to vibrate back and forth if we connect it to the correct electronics on this side, which has a capacitor which actually holds the charge so that when we pump a bit of voltage across the crystal, it deforms. When we let go, the, the voltage comes back in the opposite direction and charges it up the capacitor in the opposite direction. Then we connect it forwards again and so we can get this uh, oscillating back and forth. But the important issue is that it will only oscillate at a specific frequency. Just like a pendulum will oscillate at a specific frequency um, and therefore keeps time for an old-fashioned old clock, just so this uh, quartz crystal oscillates back and forth at a very fixed frequency and it can then keep time for our clock. Now the actual crystal that I showed you there oscillates at 3,000 or 32,768 cycles every second, right? 32,768. Now, why in the world did we choose such a difficult number <laughs> to get it to oscillate at exactly that, that amount? Well, the, uh, the trick is in maths, right? Even though it oscillates at approximately 32,768, we can divide it, that number, by two. Okay? So if we divide... 32768 by 2 we get 16384. Divide that by 2 we get 8192. Divide that by 2, 4096, 2048, 1024, 512, all the way down. And if we count the number that we've divided by, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 15. we down to 1, exactly and precisely 1. So if we divide 32,768 cycles per second by 2, 15 times over, I will get 1 cycle per second. And that's exactly what a clock needs. 1 cycle per second. It will count time in seconds. Now, I said dividing by two as if it's very easy. Well, the answer is, it is very easy. Say, for instance, we have a signal that's changing at a certain frequency, right? So it's high, low, high, low, high, low. We can connect that to a very small electronic circuit, which will do the following. Whenever this one goes down, then its output of this circuit will change. Okay, so it's high at the moment, and as that goes from high to low, it will change from high to low. Okay, now we continue, that's going up. No, that doesn't do anything to our circuit. There we are, now we're going from high to low which means this signal will change. It's at low at the moment, so it will change to high. And that continues. This goes high again. 
nothing happens because it's only going upwards. Now it's going down from high to low. So this goes from whatever it is now, high, down to low. And then it continues, and so we continue all the way to the end. You notice that our frequency has halved, right? Here's one cycle. It's that long. Here's two cycles. So we've divided the number of cycles per second here by two. And if we do exactly the same, we connect another little electronic circuit between this input and that output. And whenever this one goes down, then this one changes state. OK, so this goes down. So this was high, goes low. Goes along. OK, now it goes high, but that doesn't change anything. Circuit doesn't worry about that. And then it goes from high to low. This goes from high to low, so this changes from low to high. And so we have again halved the frequency. And that's the principle on which all real-time clocks work. And so that's what we're going to use when we use this little piece of electronics. All inside of that little black box that you saw in the picture earlier are all the electronics to be able to measure a crystal oscillating and divide that oscillation by 32768, in other words, two 15 times in a row, and that will give it a one cycle per second to work with. And then it's got memories inside here, which knows how many days have passed by and how many years have passed by and so forth and so on. All of those calculations are done inside of here. And we can ask it, what is the current time? And it will remember the current time. Now, that's very impressive. But uh, I think even more impressive is is that this will remember the time even when the power goes off. So if the power goes off to our little chip, it will still remember the time if we have connected a battery to this that says VBAT. Okay? So if we connect a 3.3 volt battery, in other words, one of those batteries that look like a, a 5 rand piece, um, its specific name is two, uh, CR2032 or CR2025. It's a 3.3 volt lithium battery. If we connect it between that and that, then this will remember the time and keep keeping time even if the power goes off. Now, obviously, if we connect this to a big uh, sign that tells, has numbers on it and what have you, it'll use up quite a lot of electricity. And so we wouldn't use that typically unless we connected it to a relatively large battery. But this little battery is enough for it to remember the time and to keep time so that when ESCOM comes back on again, then the time is still completely kept inside of this little chip. And believe it or not, this chip keeps the clock going and remembers the value of the time for, and hold on to your seats, for one battery connected here for 10 years. So a typical battery life of this coin battery here is 10 years. So basically you connect it up and leave it there and it will, once you've set the time, it will keep time for 10 years before it will actually lose track of, of time. Of course, if you want to ask it what is the time and connect that to some other um, uh, readout, a big LED sign, then, then you need your full, your full uh, power voltage, but just to keep time, 10 years. 
Okay. Now, I very glibly said we can ask it what the time is or we can set the time. Now, how do we do that? And the only eight pins available, of which two are marked X1 and X2. And X is uh, universally used as a short shorthand for Chris. So Xmas is Christmas and so forth. So uh, this is the crystal. You connect our little, our little uh, uh, crystal cylinder to those two connections and you have the crystal. There we have VBAT that we know about. There we have ground, which we are used to. Everything has to have a ground connection so that it knows how high any other voltages are relative to that connection, ground connection. So we have ground on that pin. We have VCC or our voltage, our power, our uh, uh, device voltage uh, on that pin. VCC almost exclusively refers to 5 volts. So there's 5 volts attached to that pin there. Uh, here you can actually see the output of the crystal uh, divided by quite a few different numbers and uh, including you can have this uh, square wave, SQW stands for square wave, um, and you can have a square wave that goes up and down exactly one second, uh, has a, a um, period of one second uh, and other values as well. So that's what that pin is. We only left with two pins. So we will have to talk to this chip using only two pins, uh, plus maybe the ground pin and the, vo and the voltage pin. Uh, but we have to do the talking only on two pins. And that brings us to the subject of our next lecture, and that is this number up top here, I squared C, okay, uh, which is a shortened form for IIC, which was developed a couple of years ago by uh, Philips or Sony or one of those people. And uh, they wanted to be able to talk to their devices inside their hi-fi amplifiers and that type of thing. And they said, let's talk only on two wires and make a system whereby we talk on two wires and so it is called it, it's IIC, Inter Integrated Circuit. And so if you want to talk from one integrated circuit to another one along the uh, integrated circuit board, then you can use I squared C. And this is the uh, system which this chip uses and interestingly many many other chips you get memories that work with i squared c you get barometers that measure pressure you get uh, uh, thermometers that measure temperature you get uh, things that measure the magnetic field of the earth you get gyroscopes uh, you get accelerometers a whole host of things are available all that work with I squared C. And so it's worthwhile to understand it because we're going to be using it on uh, various bits and pieces uh, throughout our experience with microcontrollers. So next lecture we will talk about I squared C.